This is a Kurt Cobain reading list. This is books he loved, books he read, books that influenced him, some books he hated, and books about him and Nirvana. With lots of quotes to support all this and where the information comes from. So if this sounds interesting to you, I hope you'll stick around. So I got the idea for this video after reading an article on RadicalReads.com from May 24th, 2019 called Kurt Cobain's Favorite Books and Literary Influences by Paige Turner, which is has to be the coolest pen name ever if that's actually the author's name and I wasn't just reading the wrong thing. Otherwise, it has no author listed. But this article lists quite a few books. And I wanted to find out where they were getting this information from, uh, so I tried as best I could to find out the connection between Kurt and each of the books on the list, because soon after this article was published on this website, a lot of other websites started to basically just regurgitate the same information. Um, there's a good article uh, from Far Out magazine, which you can read, but it has all the same books on it. And other, other websites just keep repeating, repeating the information, but this now they're saying that Kurt Cobain once made a list of all his favorite books. I, I was unable to find where he listed his favorite books, and all of these are definitely not his favorite books. Some of them are. So that's a bit misleading to say that they're his favorite books. So just because someone reads a book doesn't mean uh, necessarily that they loved it or it had an influence on them at all. Uh, there's a table of contents down below in the description if you're just interested in hearing about a particular book or author, you can just skip down there and find out more that way. I've been researching this for a few months now, reading just hundreds of interviews and articles, and I found quite a few that aren't on uh, the original list from Radical Reads or any of the other lists for that matter, that I've added in, and I think the book's most of the books I added in uh, have more of a place there than a lot of the ones they did include. Um, so let's see. So to start, we're going to start with two books that aren't on those published lists. And I'm going to call this little segment, Where Did Baby Bean Get Her Name? Um, I don't think we'll ever really know. <laughs> so much so much mystique around Frances's name. Uh, so I have heard that she was named for Frances Farmer who our first book, whoops, it was upside down, who our first book we're going to be talking about is about. Uh, but I wanted to like double check on that, and I found an article. Well, this was actually from a book. A few weeks after the article was published, Kurt was detoxing in the same hospital where Francis Bean Cobain was born at 7.48 a.m. on August 18th, 1992. Had she been a boy, Francis would have been named for Eugene, after Eugene Kelly of the Vaselines. Instead, Kurt and Courtney agreed on Francis, after Kelly's partner in the Vance Vaselines, Francis McKee. They added Bean as the middle name because they both felt Francis looked like a kidney bean in her early sonograms. Or was she named Bean from Caroline Chute's novel, The Beans of Egypt, Maine? <clears throat> and we'll get to that in a second. So I've heard it said, though, that it was Francis Farmer, but it could very well have been Francis McKee, or it could have been just a combination of both. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know for sure. Uh, but this, I think, is actually going to be the very next book I read. It's called Shadowland. It's about Francis Farmer, and it's by William Arnold. Uh, I just finished reading Ten Days in a Madhouse by Nellie Bly. Uh, so I kind of feel like it, it, it'll be a nice flow. My reading will flow right into, into Shadowland and Francis Farmer from that. I like when my books kind of, kind of flow like that. Uh, so that, that's a good fit for me for next. But I did find where he spoke about this. He spoke about this book a couple times. There's actually a video interview. I think it's an MTV video interview with Kurt Loder, maybe. 
and he met, and I didn't, I never noticed it before until I started working on this and it like stuck out to me. But yeah, uh, he mentions it in that video interview, uh, but there's also a written interview, which I have in this, this beautiful book, which is going to actually be the next book I make a video about. So I'm reading Shadowland next, but I already read this entire book, which I cannot, I cannot recommend enough. It's called Cobain on Cobain and it's just interviews. The whole thing is just interviews. Um, let me see. I have little scraps of paper with my notes for this, like every written everywhere. I've been working on this forever and I find something out and it just, it, it's, it's getting ridiculous. It's getting absolutely ridiculous. All right. So this, he's talking about Shadowland, uh, in a, in an article called, I have no desire to become any better of a guitar player. The interviewer says, by the way, who's that Frances Farmer who's going to have her revenge on Seattle? And then uh, Kurt says, what about it? Uh, and then he says, you should read Dreamland. Actual title is Shadowland uh, by this PI reporter who wrote this book about her. It's really good. And then the editor has in widely debunked. I don't know. I'm going to read it anyways. Uh, you know her story, don't you? I don't, what would they debunk about that? I don't get that. I mean, that really happened to her. You know her story, don't you? She was an actress, and she was kind of foul-mouthed person, and she hated the whole Hollywood scene, and she expressed her hatred for them publicly. And she also, when she was like, I think she was 15, she entered this essay contest when she was living here in Seattle, entitled God is Dead. And a lot of people accused her of being a communist. And then she went to New York and was part of this acting troupe, and it was supposedly had communist ties too. So then there was this big conspiracy amongst this judge, a very well-known prominent judge here in Seattle, and a bunch of other people who had ties to Hollywood, and they basically just set her up and ruined her life. They had some pictures taken of her when she was arrested for driving drunk, and it was just this big, huge scandal. And she was eventually, she was sent to a mental institution and given a lobotomy and raped every day for years and just totally abused and ended up working at a Four Seasons restaurant and dying by herself. There was no punctuation in that. <laughs> I'm sure he took a breath in there. Um, and then Chris says, it was Bainbridge Island. That's where she was institutionalized, right over there. It was this old broken down infirmary there. And then Kurt says, for years, every night, there'd be lines of custodians, friends, and people, part of the staff who would wait in line to rape her every day. She went through a lot of shit, and it just disgusts me to know that some of the people that were part of that conspiracy were living here in Seattle in their comfortable, cushy little homes and their families. And this was 20, this was 40 years after the fact, and it just makes me want to kill them. Hmm. So that gives you an idea of what that book's going to be about. <laughs> I think Kurt said it best. Um, I don't know. I haven't read it yet. I don't know what could be possibly debunked in this. Maybe that there was that many people raping her every night. I mean, but she really did get raped and all this really did happen to her. There's a movie uh, with Jessica Lange, which I did see. It's really good. Uh, she's a really interesting person. So I am looking forward to reading this. And like I said, I think I'm going to read this next. Uh, but back to little baby Francis Bean. Uh, I had always heard, I actually remember when I first heard about Francis Bean. I was in the school uh, bathroom in the stall next to another girl who was talking to another girl in another stall uh, about Francis, baby Francis Bean and where her name came from. And I remember the girl saying that she looked like a bean on the ultrasound. Uh, and Kurt said she looked like a little bean. And so that's how she got her name. And I just thought that was the cutest thing because I used to read this book to the kids I babysat and it was called Norma Jean the Jumping, the Jumping Bean. So I always thought Bean would be a really good name for a kid. Uh, but I don't know if that was really, truly how she got her name. Because there's also this story about this book. Which is actually, I believe, a series of books. Um, it's The Beans of Egypt, Maine by Caroline Shute. And I did just recently read this. Uh, so there will be a video on this one at some point. I don't know when. This is going to be a hard book to talk about. It's kind of a crazy book. So there's an article in Spin Magazine. Oh, shoot. 
I didn't, I didn't. One second. After six months of research for this video, I am woefully un unprepared and just winging it. Okay, so the spin article. I have it here. So if you go to spin online, you can read the, read the article. It's not in that collected book. Uh, so this, this is called Family Values. Uh, and it was a response to that Vanity Fair piece that was the whole reason they did this. December 1992 it was the cover story. It has that picture of Kurt and Francis. He's like in his pajamas. Is Courtney in that picture? I think I blocked her out if she's in that picture because all I'm seeing in my mind is Kurt holding Francis on the cover of Spin. But I think, I think Courtney might have been there. <laughs> Okay, so here, here's what they have to say. Uh, so Spin Magazine says, Your daughter's name is Frances Bean. Is the bean for Caroline Shoots? Is it shoot, do you think, or shoot? I think it's shoot. Shoot. Caroline Shoots' novel, The Beans of Egypt, Maine. Kurt says, Someone else asked me that the other day. Courtney says, So let's start saying yes, because it'll be the intellectually correct answer. And Spin says, well, there is a white trash mythology that surrounds both your... What the... <laughs> I gotta start that again. Wow. Well, there is a white trash mythology that surrounds both your bands to a certain degree. Beans of Egypt, Maine is like the ultimate white trash novel. And then Kurt says, well, that's the reason we named her. And Spin says, it's a great book. And then Kurt says, we're waiting for it to come out on video. And Courtney says, we don't like them books. And then Kurt says, them books is hard to read. And then Spin says, inquiring minds want to know, is Frances Bean healthy? Oh, that's rude. Um, and then Courtney says, yeah, she's very healthy. She's, and then Kurt interrupts her and says, she was a bit constipated this morning. So we gave her prune juice in a bottle and we took advantage of the fact that she doesn't have taste buds right now. Oh, I guess that's all they have to say about that book. I don't know why I keep reading that. On those lists, there's Dante's Inferno. Oops, I'm covering the name. Dante's Inferno. The Divine Comedy. Um, and I've read this. I read this in school. And then I read this, I don't know, maybe like five years ago again. Yeah, I don't know why I've read it twice, because I don't really... It's like one of those books I want to like, like want to like like I want to like but I find it really hard to get I like the idea of it I like the idea of it more than I like it it's not a lot of fun to read for me anyways I just have a hard time with this one but I'm gonna I'm gonna try it again um but where did that come from these lists having him list this as one of his favorite books it's possible I guess there's that t-shirt which has the rings of hell from the inferno uh but there's also in his journal he mentions wanting to get scenes from the 1933 movie the um dante's inferno uh the thing is with that 1933 movie if it's the one with spencer tracy it's not it's not actually this like a dramatization of this book it's about a like a Coney Island type of carnival uh, show and they put on a kind of like a production like a walkthrough production of Dante's Inferno uh, it's a really it's a really good movie really interesting movie I don't know if that's the one he's talking about though in his journals he wanted to use scenes of it in a video I don't remember which video I will read this that's not that's not top on my list though I'll tell you that. I already read it. <laughs> I already read it. I don't know, maybe he really liked it, but we can differ on some some taste in books. So the next one I have is not on those lists, uh, and this might be a bit of a stretch because I'm not even sure he actually read this book. Um, but once I found out about this book, it seemed really interesting to me, and I did read a couple pages of it. It seems really beautifully written book, so I want to really want to really read that in the near future so just 
listen, listen to me, because like I said, I don't have any proof that he actually read this book. Uh, but there's a very famous quote by Kurt, which you see all over memes, t-shirts, mugs, uh, stickers that people make, and it is, I'd rather be hated for who I am than loved for who I am not. I think that might have been in the journals. I can't remember. It's not like I memorized everything I read in the journals. But I see that quote put all over everything. Um, and it's actually a rephrasing of a quote from this book, which is called Autumn Leaves by Andre Gide. I don't know. Gide, I think, is how you say that. G-I-D-E. But his quote uh, is very similar. So I kind of think Kurt got it from him. I don't know if he read the book or just the quote, but um, Andre's is, it is better to be hated for what you are than to be loved for something you are not. So it's very similar. Uh, did Kurt read this? Did he get that idea from this? I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to read this and see what I think. It looked poetic philosophy is what I would call this book. I didn't know what to expect when I ordered it. And I've only read a few pages. I put it aside. All right, we got Jack Kerouac, Nick. So he shows up on the published lists twice with On the Road and um, the Dharma Bums, which I saw like some some I saw a video or something making a big deal out of Francis reading. I've already read On the Road, and when I read this book. I always thought like Jack Kerouac was probably overrated, so I waited so long in my life to actually read this. That was tragic. You need to just read this book. Oh my god. I love this book. It has like one of the most beautiful sentences in all of literature in this book. I love this book. I just wish I had read it like when I was a teenager instead of waiting till I was an adult to read it. Uh, but I read it when I read it and... I can enjoy it now, and I'm going to read it again just because it's on this list. I'm pretty excited. It's a little banged up. Uh, and the Dharma Bums, I'm not sure. I don't have any quotes or from interviews where he specifically is talking about these, so I don't know why. Uh, I mean, he might have mentioned just the titles. I can't remember for sure. Now, I've read so many interviews, like literally hundreds of interviews. Um... But he's mentioned Kerouac. He just does, you know, that he likes him. But I don't have any quotes, like specific quotes, telling you anything interesting from him about these books. But I'm sure uh, he really liked them. Uh, but uh, this is, I've been wanting to read this for so long, so I am just kind of including it, Big Sir. Maybe when I do a video, it'll be like a three for one video. <laughs> okay, so next is the book that is usually called his favorite, and I believe he said it, it was his favorite in some interviews. There's a lot of interviews where he talks about this book. He loved this book. Uh, and it's Perfume by Patrick Suskind. And I read this book this summer. I was so proud of myself. I took this book out in a boat, out in a kayak to read. And I got all the way back home in the kayak, and this book didn't get wet. And then guess what happened? I got out of the kayak and I dropped this book in the water. It's all, it's ruined. <laughs> I might like make art with the pages and get a new copy or like write in this copy or something. It's, it's just all warped. It's pretty bad. Not that you care. I'm go This is a long enough video. You don't need my book stories. Um, but yeah, so I read this book. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord. I understand <laughs> how this could be someone's favorite book. This is, this is an incredible book. Uh, but I'm sure everybody that's watching this, well, probably, most people watching this uh, have seen the interview where he's like with the Canadian version of MTV, I think it is, and he's taught, and the interviewer talks to him. Why am I holding this book up? <laughs> and the interviewer talks to him and asks him, what his favorite book is, and he gets like so excited to talk about it. I love his face in that video. Uh, but I have another interview for you. That one's definitely... Oh, I didn't think it would stand because it was all warped, but it stood. 
Okay, so I have an interview, another, where he's just gushing about this book, and I actually like like what he has to say in this interview more than in that video interview. Okay, so the interviewer. Scentless Apprentice is one of several songs on the new album where it seems you get very personal. It seems to relate to you having a baby. <laughs> and then Kurt's laughing and he says, not at all. It's based on a book called Perfume by Patrick Suskind. Amazing story. One of my favorite books. I've read it six times. I can't stop. Every time we're on a trip, on a plane, it's always in my bag, so I end up reading that instead of new stuff. It's about this perfume apprentice in France. I think it's the late 1700s. He has this incredible disgust for human beings. He's been an apprentice for so many years that he feels his life is pretty much useless. He knew he could be a perfume master. I can't remember what they're called. He knew he had the talent to be one of the best in the world, but he hated the idea of producing this substance that was mainly used to cover up the smell of human sweat, the smell of human flesh. The way it's written, it's just so detailed. It makes you want to cut your nose off. You feel and smell so much while you're reading this book. It really attacks your senses and I've felt that way at times like quite a few years ago I was so disgusted by human beings I felt that how do you get away from everybody and then the interviewer says so it's personal in a way and then Kurt says yes though I've never been an ex as extreme as the person in the book I hope not the person well I better not tell you about what the person in the book does um but yeah it's a, it is an amazing book I agree with him uh, and I'm looking forward to doing a video on that, but I actually think I want to reread it again. And I literally just read that back in like July or August, but I want to reread it again before I make the video. Uh, but also, the end uh, is incredibly emotional if you're thinking of Kurt and you're reading the end. And you're thinking of things he said in interviews. Um, I mean, I was like immersed deeply in Kurt Cobain in interviews at the time. But it's very, it's very sad. Like I almost like didn't want to make a, a video like this. But I think like I feel okay now with the type of video I am doing about him. Um, I feel like it's respectful. Um, but the end of that book, I, it just, I, I literally cried when I read the end of that book, thinking about him reading that book. But it's interesting what he was saying about being so caught up in the um, senses, because I was just watching something um, about people with... Uh, how do you want to say, like, extreme, extremely developed senses, sense of imagination, uh, like, uh, the poet William Blake was, I believe that's who I was watching the video about, uh, the way he was, um, describing his experience reading the book, like, he could, he wanted to cut his nose off because he could literally smell all the smells, and he says it really attacks your senses, it's, um, it sounds like hyperfantasia. It's where your imagination is so developed that you can literally like visualize before you um, the things in your mind, like what you're reading. Yeah, it sounds like he has that. Like if I said to you to visualize an apple, like how clear is your your ability to visualize it? Is it like you're actually holding it in your hand? Or are you not able to, like, actually see something here? I don't know. Everybody's different. So I would say it's safe to say that if you want to get some kind of idea about Kurt Cobain's reading likes, this is the one of the books you definitely want to read. On that list are some Bukowski books. I don't know how I got, like, all these books and forgot Bukowski. I forgot I forgot to buy Bukowski books. Um, I used to read him when I was in high school, like a book or two. I don't, I don't even remember now. I think it was poetry. I think I was reading his poetry. Um, but the list has Ham on Rye 
and post office. Uh, I couldn't find those specific books mentioned in any articles. Uh, so again, I have no real quotes. I have ha quotes of him saying he liked Bukowski. Authors that start with B. That's what he would say. He liked the authors that start with the letter B. <clears throat> but yeah, I don't have any more information on that, and I don't have I don't have any Bukowski books. I'm gonna have to get some. Uh, I just want to get this one out of the way too, and I don't have it here. I have it somewhere. I have all. All Shakespeare's plays collected uh, in a gigantic book. But um, it has Hamlet on the list. And I don't know, I'm not sure why. Uh, and I, I don't really like the reason I think it's there. Um, which is the Rome suicide note. That's really, like, really messed up. If that's the reason they're putting Hamlet on this list that's screwed up um, which he makes a reference to it in that note he supposedly wrote in Rome why would they put that on this list if that's the reason that's just that's gross um, but Hamlet's a good play that's one of Shakespeare's best I liked that one I read that in school I'd probably reread it again okay so that's out of the way Okay, so the next one is my own little discovery uh, to add to the list. So there's a recording. It's in, the, I think it's in six parts. It's on YouTube. It's an interview. But it's from November 1991. French interview. And the interviewer asks Kurt, what, uh, what poets does he like? Because he's talking about how he writes poetry. He was saying that he had started writing poetry in junior high and he'd been writing poetry since then. Uh, so the interviewers ask him, what poets does he like to read? And he says Burroughs and Bukowski. And then he says Baudelaire. But I got so excited because I myself, he says he doesn't like a lot of poets and I myself do not like a lot of poets, but I love, love Baudelaire. Um, but I don't know, like, how much Baudelaire he read. He said, and I've seen him say this a few times in different interviews, that he doesn't like to read too much poetry because he doesn't want to be influenced by other poets. He wants his own style. He wants it to come naturally, his, his style. And so there's another interview where he was talking about poetry, and this is um, an Italian interview. From November 19th 1991 so it's it's probably right around probably was like went to France and then Italy or went to Italy and then France uh, so he's giving this interview right around the same time as the um, one that you can listen to on YouTube oh so the interviewer says do you have plans for the future have you already sketched some ideas for the next album during this tour and Kurt says I have no idea for the future maybe I'll write more poems or a book or I'll make a movie Definitely, I'll continue to write songs and collaborate with some friends. Blah, 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 blah. And then the interviewer says, You said that perhaps you'll write more poems. Is that something that interests you a lot? And Kurt says, I like to write poems, and I love to read them. I like it a lot, but I don't really have a favorite poet. I purposely kept myself away from being influenced by any poetry, even if I've always had the chance to read a lot. But I don't like to be influenced. Just because I write for my own pleasure and I love doing it, especially after a show, you know, when I'm in a hotel room, it, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of like doing a crossword puzzle. And if some people someday wanted to publish that stuff I write, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a good thing because I get enough enjoyment this way. It's a kind of a personal thing. It's a recreational thing. I've only skimmed through most of the popular poets, and I really don't care for any of them. I mean, I like poetry, and I have a lot of respect for po for a poet, for each poet, but I don't... Excuse me. But I want to avoid being influenced by someone. I don't want to be influenced by anyone, because I want to try to develop my own style without having any idea of what poetry is really supposed to be like, because I think that poetry should have no definition, you know? I think that devoting myself more to poetry is something that I should do when I'm old. There are also poets among the singers, and some of them are great poets. Now it occurs to me, Patti Smith, perhaps because I love her so much, 
She's really written some good poetry, and also her songs are very poetic. Uh, but the book I have of Baudelaire is The Flowers of Evil, and I get stuck on the same poems that I like in this, so I haven't read the entire thing. I just read the ones I like over and over and over. Um, but I'll read the whole thing, and I do kind of have a theory on one poem in here, in Kurt, which I don't know if it's true, if it's accurate, but I might, I might put that in the video when I do this book. Okay, so next um, I have Samuel Beckett, and the published lists have the book's three novels, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. Uh, I don't have those. <laughs> I have Waiting for for Godot or Godet? I don't I don't know. I've I've had this like on a to read list since I was in high school in the 90s. And I recently got it at the thrift store uh, before I even started this. So that's my my Beckett book to start with. Which I think might be a good start. Take it easy on the start. I don't know. I just have this idea that Beckett is kind of heavy or <laughs> thick. I don't know. Dense? Heavy? Yeah, dense and heavy? I don't know if he actually is. That's just my impression. So I'm going to start slow with that one. Um, but Beckett is actually, uh, I would say, probably one of Kurt's favorite authors just from the amount of times he mentions him or the interviewers mention Beckett uh, in relation to Kurt in the interviews it's probably almost as much as Burroughs if not more but there is an interview where he says he's one of his favorites so this was actually the same interview the same I have no desire to become any Better of a guitar player interview. The interviewer starts, do you like Leonard Cohen? I'm not sure why he's asking him that. And I don't think Kurt is either, because he just says, hmm? <laughs> and then uh, the interviewer says, are there other writers who you could name as a sort of an influence or people who impressed you in what they were doing? And then, he start, and then Kurt lists uh, musicians and music. Uh, but the interviewer says, well, what about writers, like lyricists and poets? Poetists. Poetists? That's what the interviewer wrote. Poetists. 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 I don't know that word. Um, it's poets, right? Poetists. Uh, and then Kurt says, um, probably Beckett's my favorite. I like him a lot. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that just from the number of times. And, um, a lot of times the interviewers mention the books they see lying around his home or his ho hotel room and there's always Beckett. Uh, the interviewer says, because sometimes when I read or listen to lyrics, it sounds to me as if you are inspired by the beat writers, too, especially Burroughs. And Kurt says, yeah, yeah, Burroughs, the king, yeah. I actually got to do a record with him. Ten-inch record. And he goes on and talks about that. I don't have any specific quotes, although there was some interview. I remember he talks about Malone, Malone dies and Malloy, um, as what he was currently reading, I think. So now we're getting to Burroughs. We're getting to Burroughs, finally, who is probably his other favorite author or just person. Uh, I don't know. He loved Burroughs. I have three here. Uh, I have I have Junkie, which I read a long time ago. I have My Education, which I started to read a really long time ago and never finished. And then I have Naked, Naked Lunch. My Education... I think that came after Kurt died. Yeah, this was published after Kurt died. But I have this anyways by, by Burroughs, so I'm going to read it. Get down. I've been wanting to read, I've been wanting to read Naked Lunch for, for forever, so this is a good excuse. And then, like I said, I read Junkie when I was in my 20s, and I didn't, I didn't like it. Um, but yet I must have liked it enough that I got my education. Like, it didn't turn me off to Burroughs, but I remember I didn't like this book. Um, but time can change your impression of books, so I'm going to reread it and see what I think now. And I never got rid of the book. I held on to it, so maybe I thought I should get back to it again. Don't know. 
Um, but the list, the published lists, have Naked Lunch, Queer, and Junkie. Did I read Queer? I might have gotten Queer from the library. I don't know. <clears throat> I didn't know I had so much burrows. <laughs> That's funny. Like, how did that even happen? I just have all these burrows books. I did read, it was interesting, in one of these interviews in this book, that he, Burroughs gave him, before he even met him, uh, a first edition signed Naked Lunch, and he, he loved it. So that was cool, that was cool. But he hadn't even met him yet when, when Burroughs sent him that book. Uh, so I don't have any specific quotes uh, for any of the uh, William S. Burroughs books. I, there could be some out there. I do have from Charles R. Cross's biography, Heavier Than Heaven, there's a, a section, a uh, passage, where it says, When the tour hit Rotterdam on the 1st of September 1991, it was almost with a nostalgic wistfulness that Kurt approached the last show. He was wearing the same t-shirt he'd had on two weeks earlier. It was a bootlegged Sonic Youth t-shirt, which had gone unwashed as his jeans, as had his jeans, the only pair of pants he owned. His luggage consisted of a tiny bag containing only a copy of William S. Sparrows' Naked Lunch, which he had found in a London bookstall. So that's the only case so far where I found where it's mentioned him reading a specific Burroughs book. Alright, so on the list is Geek Love. And I'm kind of confused about uh, his connection to this book. So there was, this is like a current edition of the book. There was an older one from the 90s. And it, instead of like a normal book having a description of what the book is about, it just had a list of famous people that liked the book. And it said Kurt Cobain uh, on the back. But it didn't have, like, a quote of anything he had to say. As far as I could tell, I only saw a picture. I have this newer, newer version of it. Um, so we know he liked it. But why would they do that? Why would they put just a bunch of famous people? That's kind of gross. Like, really? You should just sell your book by what it's about. Because it's um, an interesting book. Uh... But yeah, so I tried to find I tried to find like an interview or something where he's talking about it, but I couldn't I couldn't find anything. There is a page in his journal and he wrote something like Geeks Unite or something, I think it said. I forget. I don't know if that's a reference to this though. Geeks of the World Unite or something. He might have been reading the book and wrote that. I don't know. Yeah, so I read this one. Um I had wanted to like do this video and then start reading the books, but like I said, I couldn't hold off. This so this one sounded so interesting, I had to get right to it. The same with perfume. I enjoyed this one. I'll do a video on it. Uh, but I have nothing to tell you in connection to Kurt and this book. I couldn't find anything. If you know of like any of the connections to the ones I can't, I couldn't find anything. You can tell me in the comments. There's a few books on the list that I actually don't have, uh, and at the moment, uh, because I've already read them. Uh, and also I couldn't find any specific quotes or really anything to back up why they were put onto the list. Uh, so I'm going to go over those real quick right now. Uh, I'll read you the little quote first. It's from Christopher Sanford, who wrote a book called Kurt Cobain. Uh, at Timberland Library, high school senior Kurt Cobain discovered Essie Hinton and William Burroughs, whose work would have an increasing influence on Cobain's life. He read Burgess admiringly and J.D. Salinger without complaint. Cobain hated F. Scott Fitzgerald, whose critical resurgence was in decline, and neither liked nor understood Faulkner, and couldn't talk about Hemingway without losing his temper. Um, I have to agree with him on Hemingway. I feel the same way, yet strongly... I'm drawn to him. They don't have any Hemingway on the list, obviously. And they don't have any F. Scott Fitzgerald or Faulkner because he didn't like those, I guess. I'm kind of sad about that because those are two of my favorite authors. 
Uh, but they do have Essie Hinton, The Outsiders, on the list. And they do have J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Uh, so I think uh, this is where they're getting that from, although those two books aren't specifically listed. And then it also matches he admired Burgess, so if you're just going to take the most famous books of those other two authors, you'd have to add Clockwork Orange onto the list, so I don't know why they didn't put Clockwork Orange on the list. Um, I don't know if he read, like, what Burgess he read, but that's all, that's strange. So I don't know where they're, wh that's the only place I've seen anything mentioned about S.E. Hinton or J.D. Salinger. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Also, I just want to say, so since it doesn't, I don't know where any of this information is coming from, this author, Christopher Sanford, he obviously talked to people that knew Kurt, uh, but how accurate is that? Did he look at his library checkout records or something? Like, how does he know, uh, he didn't understand Faulkner and lost his temper when talking about Hemingway. Like, where is he getting that information? Who told him that? Like, who is he quoting on that? I, I don't know where that information comes from. So on the list, I don't, there's a bunch that I have, uh, don't actually have, there's another one. There's two more, actually. Um, and they have The Collected Essays by Camille Paglia. He mentions this in his, um, interview with The Advocate, which is a great interview. It's one of the best interviews. And I got, I, that's the whole reason I bought this book, because that was the only way to read the entire interview, was in this book. Um, so that's where this, this is coming from. Uh, the interviewer says, what do you do when you're not playing music? And Kurt says, well, I'm reading Perfume for the second time. He's only on the second time here. Later on, you know, he's on the sixth time. It's about a perfume apprentice in the 1700s. And then he says, I really like Camille Paglia a lot. It's really entertaining, even though I don't necessarily agree with what she says. I still paint once in a while. I painted the cover of Incesticide. Oh yeah, this is where he's talking about making dolls and how um, he liked the things from Yugoslavia. Yeah, I just love this interview. Sorry, I was getting carried away. But that's what he had to say about Camille Paglia. So, I mean, that's like, you know how I said like that one list called it his favorite favorite books? That's not his favorite book. He just found it interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll read her essays. I've seen some videos of her talking. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but the list also has... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I'm sorry. The, the list also has... The Scum Manifesto by Valerie Solanus. And why I'm laughing is because I thought that was just for American Horror Story. I didn't know it was real. I didn't know. That's sad. That's sad. I feel so dumb. Uh, but yeah, it's a real thing. It's not just American Horror Story. Uh, he says, and I don't, rem I don't exactly know which interview this came from. I just have the quote for you. Uh, Solanus was a militant. <laughs> Solanus was a militant feminist, who, in my opinion, had some incredible ideas. Everybody called her insane because the ideas are pretty violent. The book pretty much says women should rule the earth, and I agree with it. But if you've seen American Horror Story, I think it's in in the election one. There's like a little a little thing with that. <laughs> That's all I can think of when I think of that. Alright, so the next the next book is not on the lists. The published lists. It's my own edition. I don't have the exact, like, titles he read. Uh, I just know he read Leonard Cohen. And he mentions it in a couple interviews. Uh, but I got this one. I got Beautiful Losers, just because I liked the title. Um, I was actually a Leonard Cohen fan before I was a Nirvana fan, which is it's pretty strange, because I was, I was a young child. <laughs> a young, depressed child. So I was excited that he liked Leonard Cohen. That's interesting. Um, but I didn't know Leonard wrote books. Again, I feel real dumb. I didn't know that until now. I thought he just wrote music. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to read this. I've been like having a hard time holding off 
starting this. Uh, but I don't know what book, I don't know what book Kurt read. There's this great article I found. It's not in the book, in the Bible. <laughs> it's not in the Bible here. Uh, but I just found it online randomly. And it's called Domicile on Cobain Street. The reason I love this is because of, like, the description. I love the, um, when they describe the surroundings. And this part is, like, in the middle of the article. The interviewer has just, it's just been crazy for this interviewer. And he's back at their house. And he says, Courtney, Courtney, Courtney? Oh, no, I did not just say Courtney. Okay, Courtney returns. So we head back downstairs, and after a little difficulty trying to get the tape deck to work, myself and Courtney sit cross-legged on the floor. An avalanche of records surround us. Sub Pop, Singles of the Month, Kleenex, Opal, Mud Honey, PJ's Harvey, Rid, on, rid of Me is on the turntable, and a few books are scattered on the carpet. John Steinbeck, Jean-Paul Sauter, William Burroughs is queer. Um, I don't know, like, obviously the William Burroughs is Kurt, but I mean, John Steinbeck, Jean-Paul could have been Courtney's. Uh, so I didn't put those on the list. Uh, luckily, I've read both of those authors. Anyways, Kurt grabs a book by Leonard Cohen, looks at us bemusedly, and retreats upstairs. I love that. I love that. That's like classic, classic introvert. That is the best. I don't blame him. I would retreat upstairs, too. <clears throat> Next book, my own edition. Um, okay, <laughs> this is a bit... I don't, have, I don't have my proof to show you anymore, to read to you. The proof has been erased from the internet. Uh, but this is The Life and Legend of Lead Belly. And this, this book is the book that Kurt gave as a gift to William Burroughs when he went to meet him. And how do I know that? The only way I knew that is one article, and it was called Come As You Are, 90 Minutes in Lawrence, Kansas, and I absolutely loved that article, and I went back and read that article several times over the past few years, and then suddenly the website that was hosting this article or the magazine or whatever closed and you can no longer read the article but it was that I don't know maybe someone has a copy of it somewhere of that article uh, but this luckily before it vanished from the internet I made a note of this being the book that he gave William Burroughs so I got it you know there's that quote um, and William Burroughs is the whole reason that Kurt um, started listening to Lead Belly I can't remember the quote. I'll put the quote up for you. Of the Lead Belly, William Burroughs, Kurt Cobain triangle. We'll call that. But this is the book he gave as a gift. That was his gift to William Burroughs. I haven't read it yet. I'm, I'm really interested to read this one too. Strangely. <laughs> I found the Lead Belly quote for you. I'm back with the Lead Belly quote just for you. Um... So this is from an interview. I don't know where the interview is necessarily from. It's from a book called Kurt Cobain, The Cobain Dossier by Martin Clark. And it's set up in an interview format. Um, it says interviewer Cobain, interviewer Cobain. <clears throat> but I don't know who the interviewer is. And I'm coming in in, in the middle of uh, Kurt talking. And he's talking about William S. Burroughs. But he's taught me a lot of things through his books and interviews that I'm really grateful for. I remember him saying in an interview, these new rock and roll kids should just throw away their guitars and listen to something with real soul, like Lead Belly. I'd never heard about Lead Belly before, so I bought a couple of records, and now he turns out to be my absolute favorite of all time in music. I absolutely love it more than any rock and roll I've ever heard. And that's possible that that is in the Cobain on Cobain interview book. Uh, or I just read another interview where he's talking about the same thing because that sounds really familiar to me. Oh, wow. I'm just down to one book here. <laughs> Good thing because my voice is going. 
So on the list, they have the selected works of Eleanor Wiley. She was a poet. We know he didn't read poetry. So I don't think he read, you know, more than one or two of her poems. I really don't. Um, and I didn't get her poems. I got this. <laughs> Fugitive prose, because it sounded interesting to me. Um, and I don't know what poems of hers he read. So I just thought I'd get what interested me and do this list my way. <laughs> this is a bunch of short stories. Did he read these? I don't know, but it's going to give me an idea of Eleanor Wiley. So I had a really hard time finding... Uh, any connection between Kurt and Eleanor Wiley. I have no idea what poems of hers he liked. So I think where the original article was getting Eleanor Wiley from was an article on the Poetry Foundation's website. I, I hate that article. I have never gotten so angry when reading an article. I feel like the, the author just, he was the one that misunderstood and he is the one that's misreading. Um, but it's titled something like, Kurt, Did Kurt Cobain Die Because He Misread a Poem? Yeah, I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, that article has a lot of wrong information in it. Uh, and I don't know where he got his information from. He says that Kurt um, wrote out lines to the poet Eleanor Wiley in his journal. Uh, I don't know. I've, I don't know if that's like in pages that weren't published maybe uh, because I didn't notice any when I read the journal but I don't know Eleanor Wiley's poetry uh, so I just might not have recognized it I don't know I don't know that's all the information I have uh, and then he goes on and says why Kurt liked her but I don't know how he would how he could possibly know why I kind of think maybe he was talking to Courtney because of the word choice he uses it sounds like something she would say uh, but I I don't know he's he doesn't say where he's getting his information from uh, and maybe it is just there in his journal and I didn't notice it uh, but the thing is with this list if they were going by this article again they missed they missed something this whole article's point is saying that Kurt misread a poem by a poet named Alicia Ostricker. Uh, so the list doesn't have anything by that poet on there. Um, if they're going to put Eleanor Wiley on there, why wouldn't they put Alicia Ostricker on there? Uh, and I don't think he misread that poem, to be honest, because I think it would be very unlikely for him to have misread that poem because of the parallels between that poem and uh, lyrics in his own songs, such as Sappy, it really uh, parallels with that poem. So I think that's why he might have been interested in that particular poem. I don't know, though. Uh, that was just my own thoughts. Uh, so that's the books I have that he read, supposedly read, inspired by what he read. And then I have this massive stack here. I want to get Come As You Are. I don't have that yet. I want to get Dave's book. I have a coloring. I just got a coloring book. You have to see this thing. I'm going to do a whole like review on this coloring. I don't even know what to think of this coloring book. It's it's crazy. Um, but I have this I ordered by mistake. Like I didn't even mean, I don't even know what this is. Here we are now. The Lasting Impact of Kurt Cobain. I don't know. This seems like a book that was made just to get money. That's what I, I don't know. Charles R. Cross, because he wrote this one, Heavier Than Heaven. So why did he write another one? Like, rot, couldn't, didn't he say enough in this? Why do you have to write this? I don't know. I'll find out, I guess, and I'll let you know what I think. Now this one, I tried to start. I was having a hard time. I don't know. But I'm going to read it. I'll review it. Heavier Than Heaven. I got this one. Love and Hate. Uh, an explosive in investigation into the murder of Kurt Cobain. I'll let you know. I have this one, which is the Rolling Stone interviews. So it's possible I might find my answers to some of these books because my Cobain on Cobain, um, it didn't have a single Rolling Stone interview. So I got this, which is all the Nirvana 
interviews from Rolling Stone. I believe. I believe it contains it. And then I got this. Oh, look! It's another Charles R. Cross. This guy is just cashing in, huh? Um, Cobain Unseen. This, this is, like, a really cool one. I like this. It's got his art and just stuff to look at in here. I, I flipped through this one a little. I bought these all used. It's kind of beat up. They're all kind of beat up, mostly. But yeah, that's the list. I might add more to those those books about Nirvana, about the band, about Kurt. I don't know. I mean, like I said, I might as well just go for it at this point and read every every Nirvana book on the planet, right? <laughs> I've read just about every... It feels like I've read and listened to about just about every interview. Crazy amount. Crazy amount. Okay, I think, I think I've said everything. I can't believe it. <laughs> Alright, so I hope you'll check back uh, for those videos if I do them. If it's interesting to you. Uh, or I've given you ideas of things to read. I mean, yeah. You might know everything you need to know now and not have to hear my thoughts on those books. So that's that. Uh, thanks for watching and hope to see you next time.